Before starting the show, we want to acknowledge the Black Lives Matter movement. DNA Today stands in solidarity with BLM, and in doing so, we wanted to share a few resources with you listeners where you can educate yourself by listening to Black voices in our genetics community. Dr. Janina Jeff was a guest back on episode 117, where she shared her new podcast, In Those Genes, that uses genetics to uncover the lost identities of African-descended Americans through the lens of Black culture. You can find it by searching In Those Genes in your podcast player. Please, Listen and support her show along with other Black podcasts like American Origin Stories, She Too STEM, PH Divas, among many others. We also want to bring awareness to the Minority Genetics Professional Network. This group supports minority medical genetic providers and trainees to increase the diversity in our profession and to serve minority communities. MGP also provides resources on how to support non-white patients and coworkers. You can find them on Twitter and Instagram at Minority Genetics and their website, minoritygenetics.org. You can support BLM through donations to Act Blue by going to blacklivesmatter.com and clicking the donate button on the top right. All these links and more resources will be included in the show notes and blog posts for this episode, which can be found on dnapodcast.com. How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA. You're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. On this show, we explore genetics' impact on our health through conversations with leaders in genetics. These are genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, patient advocates, and more. Sponsoring this new fertility series is Let's Get Checked. They offer home testing kits for sexual health, men's health, and women's health. A kit gets sent discreetly to your place. You collect a sample and send it back. It was really easy to get the results. I got an email notifying me. It was ready, and I popped on the website to read my results. I did their female fertility test to help me understand my hormonal health. For 20% off your own kits, use code DNA today at checkout on their website, letsgetchecked.com. Again, that's letsgetchecked.com with code DNA today for 20% off your kits. This episode continues the ongoing infertility series. If you haven't already, listen back to the last four episodes of DNA Today to hear from a fertility genetic counselor, a couple who went through reciprocal IVF, that's a two-parter episode, and filmmakers from a fertility film called Anya. Joining me on this episode to discuss diagnostic testing for fertility is Dr. Kara Goldman. She is the Medical Director of Fertility Preservation at Northwestern Fertility Reproductive Medicine. Dr. Goldman received her MD from Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine, completed her OBGYN residency at Northwestern University, and trained in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at New York University, where she went on to join the faculty. Thank you, Dr. Goldman, for coming on the show. I'm really excited to launch into our discussion here about diagnostic testing for fertility. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. To start out, when should a person or a couple pursue fertility testing? What are some signs that or red flags where people should say, hmm, maybe I should go and pursue this and see a doctor, start having these conversations? So the definition of infertility in a woman under 35 years old is 12 months of unprotected intercourse without pregnancy. So in a couple where the female partner is under 35 and they have been trying for 12 months and are not pregnant, that is an appropriate time to seek treatment. And in women over 35, the definition of infertility is six months without pregnancy. So over 35, we like to see patients back if they're not pregnant within six months. But the caveat to that is that we can initiate the evaluation at any time. And even if someone has not reached that 12-month mark, absolutely, we can start the evaluation to make sure that there is not an underlying cause for their infertility. So this can be a a general guideline for people that are like, oh, am I experiencing this yet? Am I at that threshold? But it's not necessarily a black and white. You have to be at 12 months um, of trying if you're under 35 and then six months if you're over 35. And 35, for those that may not be familiar, is what we consider advanced maternal age and genetics and fertility. Absolutely. Um, this is not black and white. And certainly there are situations where an earlier evaluation may be warranted. 
um, such as in patients who are oligomenorrheic or amenorrheic, meaning that they don't get periods and so they don't ovulate. Um, and in those cases, we know that no amount of waiting will lead to a pregnancy. And so for a patient who knows they have polycystic ovary syndrome or other causes of amenorrhea, um, we like to see those patients as soon as they're ready to start considering a pregnancy because those patients will need intervention regardless. Um, not every patient with PCOS is going to need intervention, but those who are not ovulatory, and there are many other reasons for a patient not to be ovulating and um, who may need assistance with ovulating. There are other cases where earlier intervention is warranted, such as patients with severe endometriosis, um, couples where the male partner is known to have um, male factor infertility, low sperm counts, potentially from a prior cancer diagnosis, or if they have some um, some knowledge of impaired fertility, we would want to see them early on so we can intervene. And when a couple or a person, depending on their situation, is coming in for this evaluation of infertility, what are the first tests that you order if it's someone that has a very general uh, background of they've been trying to conceive and they don't have anything particular like you were mentioning in their medical history? Where do you start? Absolutely. So, you know, we start with a really detailed history in terms of how long the patient's been trying, a menstrual history, um, any underlying medical conditions that could contribute. So a very detailed um, gynecologic history and medical history for um, both partners or in the situation of a single person, that individual. And in, um, you know, in terms of a diagnostic evaluation, we really focus on three components. And so if we're, if we're thinking just in front of us, we have a a male and a female, and there are obviously so many, um, so many families and so many variations to families. And so I'm going to focus right now on the, on the work of a male and a female. Um, but we can talk more about what it looks like for single patients or those in same sex relationships. Um, but for a male and a female couple, the female partner, we're looking really primarily at the ovary and the uterus. And in terms of the workup of the ovary, we're looking at the ovarian function. So is the patient ovulating? and looking at ovarian aging, what's the age of that patient, and we know that the age of the patient is really gonna dictate the likelihood of conception because of the risk of aneuploidy with age. And then we're looking at the responsiveness of the ovary to the hormones that the pituitary, the brain, is sending out. And so as the ovary ages, it becomes less responsive to follicle-stimulating hormone, and so these levels tend to rise with age. And so we do a pretty thorough workup of hormones. We're looking at anti-mullerian hormone, we're looking at, um, and that is a hormone that is secreted by the growing follicles in the ovary, and that is a very good test of, of oocyte quantity. So to give us a sense of how many eggs remain, um, in very simple terms, in the ovary. And then we're looking at follicle-stimulating hormone, and that's giving us a sense of how responsive is the ovary to the FSH from the brain. And again, we're going to see a higher FSH with age and a lower AMH with age, and those give us a good sense of where that patient lies compared to other women their age. And then we're looking at the um, the evaluation of the uterus. So does the patient have a normal uterus? Are there any large masses like fibroids that could affect implantation? Um, are there any polyps in the uterus? Is there any scar tissue in the uterus from a prior pregnancy? Um, and we evaluate the uterus using either a saline infusion ultrasound or a hysterosalpingogram. The saline infusion ultrasound is going to give us a better sense of how the lining of the uterus looks with some idea of how those fallopian tubes look. The hysterosalpingogram is a very specific and sensitive test for diseases of the fallopian tubes. And so it's obviously critically important to know, are the fallopian tubes open? Are there any abnormalities like a hydrocelpinx, which is fluid in the fallopian tube that could prevent a pregnancy or decrease the likelihood of success with, um, with in vitro fertilization? Um, so really the focus on the female side is the ovary and the uterus. And then, of course, thinking about the patient in a broader sense of her medical conditions, medications she may be taking, um, and any risks of pregnancy that we then have to worry about and, and think about specific to that patient. On the male side, we are looking at the semen analysis to evaluate um, what is the volume of semen, the concentration of sperm the motility of the sperm. Um, and those are the three components we are most concerned about when coming up with a total modal count. 
Um, and then we're also looking at sperm morphology, although that's less predictive of pregnancy. So there's such an array of different tests that you're looking at. It's not necessarily just, oh, you went in for a fertility test. There, there really is so many to choose from and decide which you are starting with. And it sounds like with the that first tier is really focused on the hormones for women specifically. Um, how important is timing in all of this of during a person's cycle to know where they are day wise compared to the levels of hormones? What's the relationship there? It's a very important distinction because the menstrual cycle is a very fluid cycle, meaning that the hormones change day by day. And as the cycle progresses and the ovary recruits a follicle um, and that follicle produces estrogen, as the cycle moves along, that estrogen level rises until mid-cycle when it leads to a peak in luteinizing hormone and that's what causes ovulation. But as that estrogen is going up, it is also inversely affecting the FSH level. And so as the estrogen rises, the FSH level declines. And so if you check a patient's FSH level in the middle of their cycle, that FSH may appear low, which may be reassuring to say this patient has a low FSH, that's reassuring. But if you don't check it along with the estrogen, you will be falsely reassured. And so we always check the estrogen and the FSH together um, so that we know exactly where that patient is in her cycle and that estrogen should be ideally under 75 or so to give us a sense that we can interpret the FSH level. But ideally, we'll check those hormones on around day two or day three of the patient's cycle. So day one being the first day of menses, day two and three um, are really the ideal time to look at the nadir of those hormones. So you're able to look at the person's hormones and then say, how does this compare to what a normal person with a menstrual cycle looks like and see if that is correlated appropriately and it's both looking normal or yeah. it's way off? Exactly. So we know what the FSH level should look like on day two or three of the cycle. Typically, it should be between four and 10. And an ele elevated FSH will be concerning. Um, we're also at that same time on day two or three doing a baseline ultrasound and looking at the patient's ovaries. And you can look at the ovary and identify antral follicles. And those are the follicles that are basically destined to be recruited um, and eventually to have one follicle recruited and one egg ovulated from that follicle. And you can count the antral follicles at baseline to give you an idea of that patient's ovarian reserve. So that along with the AMH and the FSH really comprise ovarian reserve testing to give us a really comprehensive picture of how well that patient would respond to gonadotropins in an IVF cycle, how well they respond to fertility drugs in general. Um, and there is also a correlation between AMH um, and you know these ovarian reserve tests and age at natural menopause. So in someone who is not only thinking about this pregnancy that they're hoping for right now, but also hoping to build a family of a larger size and thinking about what happens in three years when I want to have my second child and in five years when I'm ready for my third child or however that patient hopes to build their family, we can use these tests to gauge how, you know, how aggressive we need to be at this stage to preserve fertility for someone whose fertility may be declining faster than we would expect. So after you are doing these testing of hormones and looking at these patterns and getting more information from that is when, if there were abnormals in that, you would then move on to that next tier that you were referring to earlier of looking at the uterus and fallopian tubes and doing more of those um, procedures. I don't know if procedures is the right term for that, but um, to be able to look more detailed at that level. Yeah, so we really do this whole work up in parallel. So, you know, I'll see a new patient, we'll talk through their history, try to get a, a clear sense of how long they've been trying, what their goals are. You know, during that initial consultation, we're talking also about general preconception counseling. So what are the things that they need to do to be healthy and prepare for pregnancy? All of the tests that we want to pursue pre-pregnancy, making sure that they're immune to 
varicella and measles and all of these things, um, you know, when we have kind of this captive audience in front of us who can have the opportunity to prepare for the healthiest possible pregnancy, we do all of that in parallel. And of course, that involves talking about expanded carrier screening, making sure that the patients are, um, you know, have been appropriately tested. And we talk through in detail what that carrier screening looks like and what the options are. And so we complete that testing in parallel along with this hormone testing, along with the semen analysis for the male partner, if there's a male partner. And we talk through timing of doing these procedures like a saline infusion ultrasound or um, a hysterosalpingogram. So those diagnostic tests that give us a better sense of um, of the uterus. Um, and then once we have all that information, typically this workup takes about a month or so because of the timing of someone's menses. We'll sit down, talk through when we have all of these data in front of us, does anything point to a diagnosis? And unfortunately, many times we do not have a diagnosis. So, you know, fertility is, infertility is unexplained about a third of the time. Um, but certainly if we find a specific diagnosis, like the patient has bilaterally occluded fallopian tubes, so she has blocked fallopian tubes on both sides, then the next step is talking about in vitro fertilization because that's what IVF was initially created for. It's very effective. Um, if it's male factor infertility and there are, you know, low sperm counts, but reasonable to consider intrauterine insemination, we might talk through that path. Um, if the patient has low ovarian reserve and knows she wants three children and she's in her late thirties, we probably will talk very specifically about ways to preserve fertility, maybe bank embryos and do genetic testing of those embryos. So she knows what she has banked. And so that next conversation really focuses in on what did this testing show us and what can we now do with this information? Being able to explore the many, many options that are in building a family and if you're going down the route of IVF or all the variations within that um, to, as you said, be able to really see what's going to fit for that person, that couple, that family. How does it work? Um, you mentioned earlier, like carrier screening and having genetics a part of this. Um, carrier screening is very standard now, even if it's uh, someone's already pregnant in a prenatal setting. But for you, you're in the infertility, so it's preconception most of the time. Um, how often are you ordering other genetic testing to see if maybe that's a cause of the infertility of, of something like maybe a balanced translocation um, or other genetic factors like that? Certainly. So genetics is such an, a critical part of what we do. So obviously with the carrier screening piece of it, everyone, you know, we talk about genetics with everyone. We talk about aneuploidy with everyone um, because everyone is at risk of having aneuploid embryos. And of course that goes up with age. And so I'm very specific in my counseling about the risk of aneuploidy and the risk of miscarriage based on age. Um, but certainly genetics comes up very often in the workup of other, um, you know, in, in, in our general workup. So for example, in a patient with severely diminished ovarian reserve or primary ovarian insufficiency. So you see a 32 year old who has an undetectable AMH and menopausal FSH levels and had no idea until she had these levels checked. Maybe she had, you know, she was amenorrheic, but thought it was for another reason, or she'd be in a, been on birth control pills for years. And so didn't realize that she wasn't um, that she didn't have ovarian function. So in those patients, we would look, we would do a karyotype and look for Turner syndrome or mosaic turners. Um, in couples with recurrent miscarriage, um, or sorry, Turner syndrome or fragile X um, premutation, of course, carriers. So that's a big part of what we're looking for. Um, in, you know, male partners um, with severe azospermia, um, you know, severe oligospermia or azospermia, so really low sperm counts. Um, we might look for karyotypic abnormalities, Y chromosome microdeletions, um, various, you know, karyotypic abnormalities. And in couples with recurrent miscarriage, um, one of the first parts of that workup is looking at a parental karyotype for both partners looking for balanced translocations. Um, and that's a particularly tough diagnosis. Um, it's very reassuring to patients to have a diagnosis and have a, an explanation for their recurrent losses. And I think it, it helps the patients understand that there is no blame um, because unfortunately patients with recurrent miscarriage often feel a tremendous sense of guilt and, and obvious sadness. Um, but taking kind of that 
you know, having a diagnosis is helpful, but um, to, you know, the reality with balanced translocations is that it takes um, a lot of persistence and often many IVF cycles to achieve euploid chromosomes um, in their embryos. And so it often can be a long road to get to a euploid embryo. Um, but but it, there is absolutely a you know, an answer for those patients. Yeah. And we had a listener recently email in, um, asking about this, if that was their situation of having, um, a few kids that were healthy and either balanced translocation carriers themselves or, um, normal, uh, chromosomes there. And for those that may not know what a balanced translocation is, um, it's when your chromosomes end up switching pieces. And so, it's balanced in a person because you've got all the pieces there. They're just not where they usually should be. But in the next generation, those pieces may end up not matching. And so you have a little bit more and, and a little bit less at the same time of chromosomes. And so that can be, as you said, really frustrating for people that um, have had recurrent miscarriages. When you have a couple that has had those recurrent miscarriages, is this something that's high on your list of probabilities? Or is this like just one of many? It's one of many, um, you know, there, the workup of recurrent miscarriage involves a number of tests. Um, this is the kind of the genetic component that we worry about. Um, we're looking for things like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome in the female partner and undiagnosed diabetes, prolactin abnormalities, thyroid abnormalities. Um, so there's a, you know, a full workup that involves a uterine evaluation, uterine septum. Um, so this is one of many parts of the workup. And we tend, you know, this isn't a common finding. So we do all these tests knowing that most of the time we're not going to find something. So for the vast majority of patients on whom I'm checking a karyotype who have recurrent miscarriage, we won't find an abnormality. But when we do, it is often quite striking. And something I wanted to circle back around to that you mentioned earlier were people who have been diagnosed with cancer and seeking to either preserve their fertility um, or they may have uh, had a cancer diagnosis in the past and now looking to see what their options are at this point. What are the process for people, maybe starting with um, those that are seeking to preserve their fertility before going into cancer treatments? Absolutely. So this is so critical and such a, um, you know, it's really at the heart of what I do and the reason I went into this field to begin with, uh, because I care so deeply about these patients who are in such a vulnerable position, who have a new diagnosis of cancer, um, who are faced with all that goes into that new diagnosis of cancer, and then are also learning that this will um, or will likely, you know, impair their fertility. So it is a completely overwhelming time for these patients. Um, as soon as they have received their cancer diagnosis, really the next step is hopefully their oncologist is referring them to us to have these conversations about fertility. I think one of the major barriers is that there's, you know, we still aren't seeing all of these patients. And so there certainly are patients who are not getting informed. And just recently we had a male patient come in with um, complete azospermia because he had a cancer diagnosis at 21 and no one had talked to him about banking sperm at that point. And it's heartbreaking because when there is something that we can do about it, um, to prevent infertility, we should absolutely be doing it. So hopefully these patients are referred. And when they get to us, you know, often the same day as their cancer diagnosis or the next day, you know, we, I'll see them as soon as I can possibly see them. And it's often the same day. Um, we'll talk about the risks of their particular treatment on fertility. So we know that, you know, breast cancer is the most common cancer seen in women of reproductive age. Um, you know, next to lymphoma. And these two cancers are treated with chemo agents, chemotherapy agents that are known to be among the most toxic to the ovaries. So alkylating agents like cyclophosphamide, these agents are particularly toxic to the ovaries. And so these young women who are exposed to these agents are going to have a very high likelihood, unfortunately, of losing their ovarian function or having severely impaired ovarian function after their treatment. And so time is really of the essence. And for many of these patients who are going to be getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which means chemotherapy before they have surgery, that chemotherapy often needs to start almost immediately. So, you know, the oncologists often will give them a little bit of a grace period, give them two weeks to complete a cycle of fertility preservation, and then go right into their chemotherapy. And so, um, you know, essentially we'll talk about the risks of their treatment and then what their options are. 
And for most patients, you know, the best options, standard of care um, would be freezing eggs or freezing embryos. And the decision to freeze either eggs or embryos is really comp, you know, complex and is a very careful conversation in terms of the patient's partner status. But I would never assume that you know, a partnered patient necessarily wants to make embryos with that partner. Patients you know, want reproductive autonomy. They want the option that in the future, if they're with a different partner, they'd have the option to, pres- you know, to build a family with that partner. Um, so it's a very nuanced conversation. Um, and then the, once the decision is made, The patient meets with our psychologist, meets with our patient navigator who helps, uh, you know, obtain funding for the patient. There are there are many medication assistance programs um, to cover the medications, um, you know, work with insurance companies to see what's going to be covered, what won't. And so we will work through that process in the course of just a day or two and then get the patient started on their medications. It's about a two week process to stimulate the ovaries. And then the patient undergoes the undergoes the egg retrieval. We retrieve all of those eggs and either freeze them as eggs or create embryos and bank those embryos. And in some cases, test those embryos for um, chromosomal abnormalities. So we know exactly what that embry- what that patient has banked before starting their treatment. So this is a really involved process, and especially as you said. Patients are often receiving their diagnosis and learning about what their treatment is going to look like and later in the day sitting in your office and having a conversation about fertility, which I'm sure is just psychologically so difficult that they're dealing with so much in that moment about their life right then that sometimes it could be hard to think about the future and planning, but that what a fantastic option for people to have to be able to preserve their fertility. And I, and I really liked your comment about um, patients having autonomy of being able to freeze egg and sperm separate from their partner of having that embryo together and just all of the different options, I think, compared to so many other fields of genetics. In fertility, there just seems to be so many more options and different ways of, of doing things and different journeys and and having the flexibility there that it's uh, such a different area of genetics in my eyes. Absolutely. The, you know, the options really are endless. And I tell patients there are just millions of ways to build your family. And it, it, it looks different, you know, for every single family and every single couple and every individual. And I think that's what I think is so unique about this field that they're, um, that the options really are endless and, you know, there's, um, there's not one right way. And so, and you're absolutely right that it's completely overwhelming for these patients to come through. But I do think that, um, you know, patients find a tremendous amount of hope from this part of their journey because they are, you know, having a conversation about fertility preservation tells that patient that a someone thinks that they are going to survive this cancer, that they're going to go on and be able to build their family and that we care about them building their family, about their quality of life after cancer. And so I think it gives patients a tremendous source of hope and something to look forward to once they're done with this really dark period of their life. Um, and I have to say, we typically, you know, we would, we always have patients bring a support person with them. And it's so important to have another set of ears when you're with your oncologist and especially for these types of conversations. And it's just been so hard lately because of COVID. You know, we are, you know, these patients receiving these diagnoses and, you know, diagnosis of cancer, a diagnosis of possible infertility in the midst of a pandemic. I mean, it is completely overwhelming, but also so inspiring to see the, just to see the strength of these patients. Such a a combination of, as you said, with the cancer diagnosis, but then being able to look towards the future. And I mean, certainly during this pandemic, that uh, is a whole another level of, I've seen a lot of people in the infertility community online, on Instagram, um, that people are not being able to receive their treatments or, you know, their family planning is on hold right now. Um, And just how difficult it is that, as we've mentioned throughout the episode, a lot of this is very timely of, you know, you're down to the day and treatments have to be certain hour. And so having a pandemic where you cannot go in to get your medications and see your doctors is, I'm sure, just so difficult and very hard to navigate. But I want to thank you for coming on the show and being able to share all this insight. It's such an interesting area. I mean, I've done a whole series on this just because I think that there is so much to explore here. And honestly, it could be a whole podcast on its own, but really appreciate you 
being able to share your insight on all of these topics and how the testing works and also just the side of the patients and, you know, why you got into this field and being inspired by these cancer patients and being able to give back to the community. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. To learn more from Dr. Goldman, you can follow her on Twitter at Kara Goldman MD. Any information that you would like to learn about the show or more information for this episode can be found at dnapodcast.com. We also have over 120 episodes on there. You can search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and connect with us. Right now, we have a giveaway on our social media for the movie Anya. If you haven't yet, definitely enter so you can watch Anya. Last episode, I had the filmmakers on the show, and I really enjoyed the movie. So if you like this show, I think you'll enjoy the movie as well. Our YouTube channel just launched last month thanks to our video editor and YouTube lead, Sophia Salandino. We uploaded our Match Day Zoom celebration, which was hosted by myself and a few of my Sarah Lawrence classmates, where we did a really fun Q&A with newly matched students and other listeners about starting genetic counseling grad school. So big thanks to our marketing director, Laura Markham, for organizing the event. So definitely pop over to YouTube, search DNA Today, and hit subscribe to support the show and stay updated with all our activities on there. Any questions for myself, Dr. Goldman, any other guests we've had on the show, you can email info at dnapodcast.com. Uh, we love hearing from you listeners. It's great to be able to connect because sometimes this show feels very one way, but things like our Match Day Zoom celebration was really great to connect with a lot of you. Let's Get Checked offers a variety of home testing kits, including fertility, but also sexual health with STI testing. According to the World Health Organization, of the 19 million Americans who contract a sexually transmitted disease each year, only 50% are aware that they're infected. Only 50%. People who are sexually active should all be doing STI testing on a regular basis. Luckily, Let's Get Checked makes it easy by sending a kit right to you in discreet packaging. It's just like the other kits I've talked about. You collect a sample, pop it back in the mail. Wait time is quick with results in only two to five days. As most of you know, Let's Get Checked also provides fertility testing too. If these episodes make you curious about your own fertility status, you can start learning with their kits. I did the female fertility test and had my sample run in their CLIA certified lab to know more about my hormone levels for specifically follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone and a bunch of others. Try any of these kits for yourself by going to letsgetcheck.com and use code DNA today for 20% off your kits. Again, you can use code DNA today for 20% off your kits at letsgetchecked.com. And that code works for any of the sponsors from the show. DNA today is the code to be getting all these exclusive deals as a DNA today listener. Thanks for listening and join us next time to learn, discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. 